what a year it's been for naked bikes. For sporty naked bikes in particular. We've seen everything from a naked version of Kawasaki Supercharged H2 to a defrocked Panigale. 200 horsepower in a naked bike doesn't even make you look twice anymore. And all of a sudden, the likes of the Beast, KTM Super Duke R, seem like they might be a little underpowered with only 180 horses to play with. And don't even start with the likes of BMW's S1000R or Yamaha's MT10. They've got outputs down in the 160s, so they're not even worth looking at anymore. Well, some spec sheet warriors might think that, but they'd be idiots. I love the MT10, and until recently I owned a S1000R, and for good reason, it's still an excellent naked bike. Power, as any experienced biker knows, isn't everything. In the past I've owned a Triumph Street Triple R when I could have owned a Speed Triple, bigger and more powerful. But the street was more fun, more playful, more rewarding to ride, and along a twisty back road, faster as well. I've got a feeling that this little beast, the KTM Duke 890R, could be much the same thing. You may recognize this bike, or at least you may think you do, because it is effectively the 790 Duke that arrived last year, but with more. More engine, more suspension, more electronics, and in theory, a lot more fun. If you're not a bike nut, as I'm sure most of our viewers are, you'd struggle to tell them apart. It is, with the exception of the orange frame, in the quality of the components that the differences can be seen. Brembo Stylema radial calipers, WP Apex suspension with increased levels of adjustment, and a set of race-ready Michelin Power Cup 2 tyres provide obvious clues to the 890's sporting intent. What you can't see are the engine internals and the 91cc increase in displacement that have resulted in an engine with a significant 16 horsepower gain to a new maximum of 119. Torque is also up well over 10% to 99 newton meters. A heavier crank, increased bore and stroke, and revised cam profiles are some of the details behind the increases. But with the bike to ride, I pulled my nose out of the spec sheet and headed out of town. Well, I'm less than five minutes outside of Matikoven, the KTM Moto Hall, where I just introduced you to the 890R Duke and already the road is getting twisty it's beginning to climb and we've uh, found ourselves in some woods it's a little bit of a interesting road so forgive my stilted speech I do need to concentrate a little bit on the riding the immediate thing that you notice is that the bike is so narrow, especially here around where your legs meet, the tank splays out above it, but um, it feels so narrow, it helps make it feel small. The seat height might not be particularly low, but because it's so narrow, I don't think you have to be a tall person to feel nice and comfortable and confident on here. In true KTM fashion though, the seat is on the hard side of firm. And because this is an unashamed sport bike, the foot pegs are now a bit higher and further back than they are on the 790. And the handlebar is a touch lower and further forward. It's a sportier riding position, but it's no racing crouch, so you can still spend a decent amount of time in the seat. Still in tourist mode, and uh, why not? Because it's absolutely beautiful around here. And so I haven't been revving the engine much above five. I mean, even three to 5,000 RPM, there's a proper level of punch. Quite how punchy the 890 feels is down to which of the three riding modes you choose, which also influence, with relation to the bike's lean angle, the ABS and traction control, as well as throttle responsiveness. It really is getting twisty as well now. Oh, and bumpy. Suspension is firm, that much is obvious. Um, yeah, oh, 
yeah, definitely uh, <laughs> paying less attention to the scenery now. Oh, yeah. Oh, the motor's got some kick. Oh, brakes. Oh, the Stylema Brembo's again, and they are monstrous. On a bike that's as light and as nimble as this, they, they almost feel overpowered. But, with their adjustability, you can change the ratio on the Brembo Master Cylinder, which I have done. I've dialed it back from what you might have on the track. A bit more feel, a bit more ability to moderate them. I don't need track levels of... Oh, the, what, how many air pins have we got here? That's ridiculous. Oh, downhill, off camber. Oh, don't like it. 890 doesn't mind them though. The steel frame is exactly the same as it is on the 790, albeit with a little bit of extra ride height. What has changed though is the 790's basic and largely unadjustable suspension setup. The upgraded WP forks and rear shock do a fantastic job of keeping everything in control the harder you ride. Perfect for track day action and back roads like these as well, though when it gets really bumpy you do wish the springs were just a little softer. Well, if the guys ever need a quick test ride from the factory, wow, I guess I know where they're coming. Oh, it does flow though. I tell you what, the Super Duke 1290 would not be as quick as a bear. Whoa! Unseen roads, gotta be careful, get carried away. Oh, quick shift is nice when it's revving. And punch, damn, it punches! It may look like a close cousin of the 790, but to ride, it is a very different beast. A mini beast to the Super Duke's Maxi Beast. It may have 60 horsepower less, but it still feels like an aggressive, in your face sport bike. The 790 was dubbed the Scalpel by the factory, but it is a much more dull blade than that in reality. That was marketing hype that didn't work. The 890 is more like a true Scalpel, operated by a surgeon who also happens to be a bodybuilder. So yes, I may only have had this bike for a day and it's, you've got to be honest, that isn't normally long enough to pronounce any kind of verdict on a bike. But I tell you what, I have no hesitation whatsoever in recommending this bike to anyone who's in the market for any kind of naked sport bike, whether that be middleweight like this or indeed a bigger one. You need to give this serious thought. It has a magical mix of abilities that allows it to be, on one hand, a hardcore sport bike, and I do mean hardcore, punchy motor, really responsive handling, firm suspension, and at the next moment, like now, it's a really docile, agile, amenable commuter. It's an everyday bike that's a special occasions weekend bike as well. Yeah. If you're in the market for a kind of bike that can get you to work and thrill you beyond belief on your Sunday morning ride, this is it. Welcome back. Now, before the break, you saw the result of me spending a day with KTM's Duke 890R. Uh, a bike that is now termed a middleweight sport bike, even though it's nearly 900 cc's, which is barely less than the 1,000cc superbikes that I grew up riding and they were all beasts. I mean, how the world changes. I have to say, just before I get into some of the things that I didn't quite like that much, uh, it really did remind me, not in terms of its agility, but in terms of its character and the almost simplicity with which it delivers its thrills of a bike I owned many years ago and I would love to have back is Aprilia's Tuono R, the factory R, I can't remember the exact designation, but the Tuono was a V-twin then when it first came out and was also kind of very raw, very immediate, and the 890R gave me many of the same feelings. I have to say, 
as I did in the story, I could look. The 1290R's engine is just bonkers and, and, and made me giggle a lot when I was riding. It also made me frightened. But I mean, I quite like that in a bike. Uh, I'd love a, a Super Duke R, but part of me thinks that the 890R would actually be slightly more practical and, and just as much fun, but in a different way. Both of them absolute beasts. What does annoy me though, and I suppose this applies across the KTM sport bike models, is the fact that the pricing is almost a little bit deceptive. It, it comes across as KTM being, I, I have to say, a little bit mean because you get a great price and then you have to add more options to make it the full Monty bike, for instance, that I rode around Matikoven. That was loaded with everything. Now, if you want all that stuff, you have to add about three different packages and that can bump up the price quite significantly, although it is still very much a bargain, I have to say, for what it offers. But you need to spend money on something called MSR, uh, which is about motor slip regulation or something. It's basically a kind of electronic form of slipper clutch. It uh, affects the engine braking, particularly useful on a track. It means you get consistency on the engine braking. Uh, and then you need the track pack for things like, uh, if not the quick shifter, then certainly super moto braking, which is also great fun on the road and great for the track. That's where you can disengage the ABS at the rear and just keep it on the front. So you can sort of try and slide the bike around uh, on the back. Uh, what else do you get? A launch control that is also unlocked with the track um, pack, as is, well, wheelies. Oh, but there we go. That, that applies to the big bike as well. You need to add money in order for the bike to electronically take off its anti-wheelie mode. So I'm sorry, but there's something wrong there. If you have to pay to let the bike do what it could quite happily do otherwise. I mean, who wants a sporty naked bike that won't wheelie? It makes no sense, comes across as mean and... Um, Really, it, it's what the bike wants to do anyway. It's, uh, yeah, traction control, uh, launch control is even in there as well. So, and actually, now I think about it, I'm on a roll now, standing old and grumpy, is um, one of the most useful features of the track uh, pack is the fact that you can use uh, the, the buttons on the handlebar to go up and down through the levels of traction control, which would be particularly useful, say, at a track day where you're coming towards the end of uh, your third or fourth session, the tires are getting a bit worn. Uh, maybe you're getting some warning signs from the rear end. You can dial up that traction control. So, uh, yeah, that's really annoying. They should just kind of give you one base price and, and be done with it. Affordability-wise, it's still pretty good. And especially in its base price, you'd have to say that it's, uh, it's bad news for the 790 Duke. It's also bad news for the 790 Duke owners who've already splashed the cash last year. Uh, I have to say, you know, get rid of your 790 because you're missing out. The 890 is not just a bit of an improvement. On the specs it might be, but it's still pretty big. But in real world terms, it's just a, a much, much better bike. Um, yeah, and, and how, where does that put the 790 now? I mean, how are they gonna sell that when the price difference isn't really big enough? And you can't make the 890 more expensive, but possibly what they could do is make the 790 more affordable, whether that involves taking a little bit of power away from the engine, taking some of the electronics away, which by the way, you don't pay for the electronic extras on the 790. I think if I remember correctly, that doesn't seem to make any sense. And, uh, you know, maybe cheap, make it more affordable with stuff like a single front brake disc or something like that. The price, that needs to come down in price so it can be a kind of entry middleweight bike. In terms of its competition, from other manufacturers, really, the only thing I can think of is Triumph's Street, yeah, Street Triple RS, which uh, the 765, which is a lovely, sophisticated bike. Top of my head, the 765 is more refined and has obviously got the triple motor, which delivers a different kind of thrill. But uh, the 890 is more raw, more immediate, and yeah, dep depends which mood you're in. I think if I had to choose, I'd, I'd go with the KTM, I really would. So overall, an absolutely wonderful bike. I highly recommend it. Uh, KTM, just stop being so cheap with your electronics. I mean, really, get a grip. It's beneath you.